All right. I think we're ready to get going. Thanks for the uh, kind words there in the chat. I appreciate it as always. So I'm not going to ask you where you are, how you're feeling, because I know the answer. Shut up, John. Teach me something. Okay. Everything's going to be okay. Just remember, I always like to say at this time of year, uh, this is to me is the worst part of bar prep. The adrenaline rush, all the excitement, the hoo-ha of starting bar prep. Even if you didn't have that this time, after a couple of weeks, you hit the wall. The adrenaline crashes. You're piling up all those subjects. If you're taking a course, it's just too much information. You're starting to get a little tired doing questions, the, the lectures, the material. You know what I'm saying? You hit the wall. And it feels overwhelming. But at the same time, you start getting that little butterfly sick feeling about, oh, my God, the bar's next month. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Remember, most people, again, I'm generalizing, most people started about a month ago, give or take, if you're doing a course, a, a major commercial course, right? Mid towards end of December. So you've learned, you've covered a lot of information since then. And you still have that same amount of time, roughly a month until the bar. The good news is hopefully most of the learning is behind you, the lectures, the material, et cetera. And as I like to say, first half of bar prep should be two thirds law, one third practice, so that February could be three quarters practice and one quarter law. So this is the worst time you're supposed to, you're supposed to feel bad. Everybody does. But hopefully February, though there'll be more anxiety, it's not as much of the learning. It can be more of the practice. So this is the way you're supposed to feel and what happens this time of year. This is when you tend to get a little sloppy sometimes with the reading comp. You get tired. You're pushing too many questions too quickly, too many practice tests. All these things we'll talk about in a second. And so you start to lose some of the sharpness that maybe you had at the beginning, especially when you're only doing one or two subjects at that time. So we're going to talk more about that. And that's why it's a refresher of just overall approach, where I should be, what I should be doing. As always, I try to speak to everybody out there. I know some of you are taking a commercial course and or some of you are first time takers versus the repeat takers. So again, first time taker, you either are about to take your mock MBE or you just took it, right? This is right around that time. Your course is going to give you a mock test. If you are in that place, remember, I'm always talking about there's the rules and there's the reading. I don't recommend doing a practice test before the practice test. Some people do too many questions before the mock test. It's all about the rules. It's all about the black letter. Again, at the risk of sounding like a used car salesman, if you're feeling like, hey, I'm starting to lose it a little bit from my course that got too overwhelming, any of the lectures I have on Adaptive Bar will, will kind of pare that law down and give it a little more of a concise material. I am, I did write it ready, John. I know all your stuff. Okay, all right, take it easy, just saying. If you are a little overwhelmed from the course, then you want to reduce that focus just on the black letter. You take the mock test. Absolutely. It's a great exercise to see where you are with the reading comprehension. So if you are the best uh, preview practice you can do for your mock test, make sure you have a good foundation of law. Go in there and read the questions. And that's why we're going to do again another little refresher. Overall reading comp approach. Good. You're not doing a course, repeat taker, doing stuff on your own. We get all these questions all the time. How many questions should I do every day? How many practice tests should I take? At this time of year, I'm not a big practice test guy because most people, I'm generalizing, are still fixing, learning, and putting together each individual subject, okay? A mock test doesn't prove you're going to pass, doesn't prove you're going to fail. That should be for February. Right now, you still want to master as much law in each subject as possible and practice questions topic by topic. So you're maximizing your points in tort, in crim law, in evidence and property. Then, because if, if three or four of those subjects are still a little wishy-washy, people say, I'll just take a practice test, see where I'm at. Well, if three or four quest, uh, subjects are still a little wishy-washy, the practice test is going to not be too good because the practice is just the culmination of all the subjects. So don't worry about the damn practice test until you're feeling strong enough on all seven, and then you can sit down and do a practice test. How many questions should I be doing every day right now, John? Well, again, if you're just taking MBE, you're a repeat taker, kind of doing your own thing, you probably have a little more time on your hands. Again, right now, if you've finished all the subjects, if you know all subjects, I always recommend a mixed set right now of 30, 35 questions, which still gives you time to recite law, to review law from a single MBE topic per day, which I think is very important. You're doing your course, 
you're still working on some subjects, you do what your course tells you to do. And I would do extra questions on Adaptabar Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Do practice questions on the weekend on Adaptabar if you're taking your course. Don't try to squeeze it all in because then you're going to be exhausted. And again, you develop poor reading habits. So until your course is finished with your MBE lectures, do what they tell you to do, but do adapt the bar as additional practice on the weekend. Once your course has completed all seven MBE lectures and you've done a good review, and maybe this weekend is a good time to kind of do a boot camp review from Friday to Monday, or again, in anticipation of your mock test, review the law. Then I would switch and I would be exclusively doing adapt the bar. And again, if you're trying to balance your essay portion, if you're taking both parts of the exam, 25 to 30, 30 to 35 mixed MBE is doable. It's an hour if you're doing it on time, roughly about an hour of actual practice because it then still gives you the time to go balance your time with the essay. So not 50 or 100 a day because then you're just practicing questions going over and over again and getting a bad approach, but you're forgetting too much law and or you're not practicing your essay or other state portion. Once the courses are done, then you can actually increase the amount of questions. But remember, the amount doesn't matter. That's, are you reading them correctly? Everything is quality over quantity. You're trying to get more questions correct. That's the goal. More questions correct. Doing more questions. If you just do the adaptive bar program five times and did 10,000 questions, it is not a guarantee of success. That's why so many people will email me. I've, I've been doing 50, 60, 80. I'm doing 2,000. I'm doing numbers, but my number doesn't go up enough because the wheels in the car are literally spinning in the mud. You're not fixing the problem. The issue is why are you missing the questions? When you make the mistake, why? Is it the rule? Is it the reading? So this time of year should be the time that you go all in on when I do more practice sets every day, 30, 35, 40, and I'll tell you how to expand that into February for more. I got to feel as good as I possibly can with the rules so I can focus exclusively more, most of my time on the practice. If you feel you know the law, but you're still struggling with the questions, that's my segue into what we're doing here tonight. But just doing the practice alone, adapt the bar is the best set of questions in the world. No question about that. I'm biased, obviously, but I know that's the case. But the questions are only as good as how you are reading them. That's the key. Make sure that you are focusing on rules, then practicing reading. So we're going to walk through some practice questions, do a cursory review of approach. Again, at the risk of sounding like a used car salesman, if you feel you need after this more detail, a more focused approach uh, regarding reading the questions, why am I picking A, why are A, B, C, B, C and D wrong, etc. There is a standalone lecture on Adaptive Bar called Mastering the MBE, which is me going over for an hour and 20 minutes in further detail, specific reading comp approach, how to avoid getting it down to two, et cetera, et cetera. So if you feel that that's still more of an issue and need a little more guidance after this, please check out the Mastering the MBE video on Adaptabar. That was exclusively about approach and reading comp. With that, I'm going to share the screen. Here we go. Give it a second. Okay, you should be good to go with uh, some questions here. And we're going to walk through a couple and talk about approach. Sorry, just want to make it a little bigger here if I can. So hopefully you can see it that much better. Okay, so let's walk through this together. Okay, just for time constraints, let's just walk through this together. Do me a favor and read the facts and the call. Don't look at the answers, just read the facts and the call. I'll give you a minute. So what do we try to take from a question like this? I'm always talking about issue spotting. Notice the call of the question. In a suit against a man, is a neighbor likely to prevail? That doesn't tell me anything. So let's go over big picture, big picture. You read too fast. You're trying to do too many. Most people, human nature, are trying to get into the answers too quickly, literally, before they know what they're looking for. People have been trained to tell you, look at the call of the question. 
you see in a suit against a man is a neighbor likely to prevail see it's torts john probably torts okay fine but you don't know what tort okay so again when the call of the question doesn't tell you the name of the rule that you're looking for you don't know so the worst thing you could do now is look at the answers even if in your gut you have a sense of who's who's going to win and who's not will he win or will he not issue spotting Every single MBE question, with a couple of exceptions, is about one single issue. That's why John's always yelling, what's the issue? Not what are the issues. Torts. There's a dog. A dog injures somebody. What tort is that referring to? Strict liability. Strict liability equals abnormally dangerous activity, wild animals. Issue spotting. A dog injured somebody dumb everything down ask yourself because they're not going to tell you you must hear the little voice in your head what's the issue strict liability but a dog is not a wild animal you're usually right the domestic animals not strictly liable wild animals are strictly liable but can a domestic animal become wild according to mbe yes if the animal has dangerous propensities if it's the bad dog in the neighborhood what is this kind of a dog? A nice, cute little dog or a ferocious dog? They tell you it's ferocious. How do you know? The facts tell you. But that demands that you slow down because by now you've done X number hundreds of tort questions and you see she uh, German Shepherd, well, German Shepherd, but it's a dog. Okay, no strict liability. And you miss the word ferocity. Oh, that's right. The, the dog can become a wild animal. But what do you know? Dog, wild animal, that's strict liability. You can jump into the answers and still make the mistake. What other mantra did John preach on every single subject on the bar? There are hundreds of defenses and exceptions to every single rule across the board, from tort to crim pro, civ pro. You never apply a defense or an exception unless that's what the fact pattern is talking about. They give you answers. You've seen these. Crim pro with the exigent circumstances, hearsay, ripe with all the exceptions, assumption of the risk, pure comparative negligence. Never apply the defense unless that's what the hypo is talking about. Are they talking about a fence here? Uh, a type of fence. Are they talking about a defense here? Yes, because what is the single legal defense to strict liability? Assumption of the risk. Normally, assumption of the risk does not apply, but does it here? Yes, because what does the fact pattern tell you that the guy read the sign, that he saw the sign and he knew about the, the dog being bad and he did this anyway. You have dog, normally not strict liability, not a wild animal. Ferocious dog, made it a wild animal. Normally that would be liability, but they gave you the defense on top of that. Huge issues, huge fact in that little five line fact pattern that if you read five seconds too fast, you're in the wrong answer. Before you look at the answer choices, what am I always saying? Before you look at the answer choices, what is the answer I'm looking for? Well, is the neighbor going to prevail? No, because of assumption of the risk. He knew. Assumption of the risk. Notice nowhere in the fact pattern does it use the term strict liability, wild animal, or assumption of the risk. Not in the call of the question, not in the fact pattern. That's all issue spotting. So when you're racing through the hypo to see the best answer, you're looking for something that you don't even know what you're looking for. Going into the answers, what am I looking for? He's not going to prevail because he assumed the risk. Go take a look at answer choice A. Notice that A does not say the words assumption of the risk, but is A basically in what I call plain English telling you that? Yes, take a look at B. What is answer choice B about? Trespass. I could argue that on a tort essay, John. You could, but what the bleep does trespass have to do with assumption of the risk? Nothing. What sound should you be making with your number two pencil? Whoosh. Get it out of there. C. Invitee. Invitee. When do you talk about whether someone's an invitee? Whether they have a duty of care? So what kind of question is that if you're talking about an invitee and a duty? negligence and what the bleep does negligence have to do with strict liability assumption of the risk nothing d notice how they bait you abnormally dangerous that's the closest thing to strict liability i don't like the other answers i'm going to pick d because that's the best legal answer that has the buzzwords john i take very copious notes i have a strict liability one of the things says abnormally dangerous activity notice b c and d all gave you buzzwords Notice A was the only one written in plain English. 
But what answer do you always pick times 200 questions? The most specific answer to the facts, to the facts. Is the guy liable? No, because he read the sign, he assumed the risk, which in English means what? He knew what the hell he was getting himself into. What is the most specific answer? A, shut up and pick it. All of the question didn't tell you. The facts always will. Slow down so you spot the issue. What was the fact pattern telling you? Was it just a dog? Was it a wild animal? Were there any assumption of the risk? The facts, the facts, the facts will tell you. You want to take the full 1.4, uh, 1 minute and 40 seconds of the proverbial 1 minute and 50 seconds you generally have in the facts so you know what answer you are looking for. When you get to the answers, don't keep saying what's the best one, which one is the most specific to the facts. I like for people to say, what is each answer about? Notice that if I was labeling each answer choice, A would be assumption, B would be trespass, C would be negligence, D would be strict liability. I'm just going to skip for a moment, if you don't mind. I have this chart that I use with some students where I basically make them write down, just label issue. In this question, strict liability, assumption. A would literally say assumption. B would say uh, uh, trespass. C would say negligence. Don't look at the answers as some big paragraph. See if you can begin to highlight or label, identify, give each answer a heading, a name. What is each answer about? so that that way you literally can talk yourself into the correct answer. You're not looking for the better one, you're looking for the one most specific to the facts, most specific to the facts, so then you can shut up and pick it. You know in contracts, property, con law, many times the answer choices are longer than the whole hypo. You get lost in the words, you don't even remember what the hell you're reading. How do you get out of that? Keep These are my words, you incorporate any way you like. What is each answer about? Every answer choice on the bar, either by buzzwords or plain English, is making you think about something. There's one issue, but usually four different answer choices. Connect those dots. I'm always picking the answer most specific to the facts. Here's a property, excuse me, yeah, a uh, property question. Nobody likes them. So again, Let's do it. To forget the answer choices, okay? You see down at the bottom, read the hypo and the question however you like. I don't want to tell you what to do. You read the facts and the call whichever way you like. Okay, mortgages, nobody likes them, but they're not that bad. Remember, eat, they're not expecting you to be a mortgage broker. They're just testing you on different definitions regarding mortgages. What's one of their favorite ones? Did the buyer assume the mortgage? Did he take subject to the mortgage? They. How will you know? What is John saying? They'll always tell you. So if you looked at the call, is the man liable to the bank for the deficiency? If you just looked at the call, even you'd have an idea, it could be about a mortgage, but you'd have no idea what it's really about, what the facts say. You see paragraphs with money, you're thinking, oh my God, this is going to take me too much time. If you know your rule, it's going to take you less than a minute because you'd know what you're looking for. So if you're looking at a question like this and you're ready, I don't know what's going on here. That would tell me, maybe you need to go back to your rule and say, wait a minute, when I read the explanation, it's going to talk about who assumed the mortgage. If I don't remember what that means, doing more of these is not going to help you. You can't learn the law at this time of year from doing the questions. If you're writing down the rules and the explanations, it means you don't know the rule yet. You should be going back and doing a good day review of the rules so you'll know what it looks like when you do the questions. Otherwise, if you're just writing explana writing uh, rules from the explanation, you're just chasing your own tail because every day there's going to be more rules. That's why you're getting done at 11 o'clock. Stop the questions for a day or two. Get back in there with the law. Then feel better with more law and then come back to do the questions. So what happened here? 
is the man liable to the bank for the deficiency? Well, what did the man do? There was a woman who owned the property. She had a mortgage. And what did the man do? End of the first paragraph. It told you that he assumed the mortgage. Rule. What does that mean? Does he become primarily liable? Yes. Could they go after the woman secondarily? They could, unless there's some sort of a novation, a release, that she, the original person was released from all liability. I preach and teach, never infer or assume a novation unless they tell you. Did they tell you here? Blatantly, they did. It then says, without telling the guy, the bank released the woman from any further liability. They usually do not say that, but they did here. That's reading comprehension. That's what I'm always, always talking about. At this time of year, you see enough of these hypos. They begin to all look the same. Usually you'll do five or six where there was no novation slash release. Now all of a sudden they give you one. Which one will you see on the day of the bar? Who knows? But if you're practicing now, slowing down and focusing more on the facts, that's what you're going to do on exam day. You perform the way you practice. If you practice slowing down and spotting the issue in the facts, look how much information they're giving you. It says he assumed. It says he released. That's the difference between just knowing the law and knowing what it looks like. So going into this, is the guy going to be on the hook? Yeah, he assumed the mortgage. He's now solely on the hook. So is the man going to be liable for the deficiency? He is because the woman is out and he assumed the mortgage. Sorry. So take a look at the answer choices. So, you know he's going to be liable because you read the facts. Does this have anything to do with clogging the equity of redemption? Or is this about the man's personal liability that he assumed the mortgage? D, again, you could get it down to two to say yes. I should have said in the tort one to come to the same conclusion. What do you do when you get it down to two and you know John's going to win? When you know it's constitutional, when you know it's admissible, when you get it down to two and they're both about the same conclusion, two yeses, the two yeses will always be about different rules, different torts, different crimes. Don't compare which is better. Contrast them and say, what's the difference between the two? I'm doing a question about the guy assumed the mortgage, so he's personally responsible. Which answer is the most specific that says that? D, man's personal liability not affected by the woman. Notice they didn't say assume. Yes, because he assumed. And yes, because there was an ovation. Notice that D is basically plain English. C is getting you with equity of redemption. But what is equity of redemption? Redemption is about when you're trying to pay off the mortgage before your, the foreclosure sale. That's not what's going in here, on here. So sometimes people read D and say, well, I don't know. That doesn't really say much. I don't remember what clogging redemption is, but I'm going to pick the legal phrase. Always pick the most specific. So even if you forgot novation, even if you forgot a term, do you see how much information they're giving you here in the facts? The difference between C and D, keep contrasting the difference between C and D. Each answer is talking about something different. Always be asking what each answer is talking about. If you didn't remember the rule, go back and don't, reach, don't try to outline the answer and then do the next property question. You're not going to get better. Take the day or two and review the law. Versus crim law. Take a look again at the, at the facts and the call of the question. I'll give you a minute. A weird hypo for a lot of people. I love this question because it shows like the first one, how mechanical, these are my words, you want to be. Meaning, issue, connect the dots, even if you don't understand it and it doesn't make sense, just shut up and pick it. What issue did they make the question about? Murder. There are four. Intent to kill, intent to inflict serious bodily harm, felony murder, depraved heart murder. When they make the question about murder, your answer has to be about one of the four murders. 
even if you didn't remember or identify from the facts which one you're looking for, look how different those answer choices are. I'm doing a murder question. That's my issue. I have to pick the most specific answer to one of the forms of murder. What did they give me here? Strict liability. Strict criminal liability. That's a thing, but that has nothing to do with this. B. Reckless. When's reckless an important word? When? Depraved heart murder. Excellent. Reckless disregard of human life is one of the four murders. C. Regulatory offense. The hell does that have to do with murder? Nothing. Whoosh. D. Proximate cause. When do I talk about proximate cause? Negligence. When do I care about negligence and someone dying? Manslaughter, which has what to do with murder? Nothing. Whoosh. Don't think. Don't understand. What is each answer about? Connect the dots. They make it about murder. Thank you. Has to be one of the four. Even if you didn't understand why in the facts it was reckless, he knew or should have known this could occur. But if you forgot, misread, who cares? What is the key? Once they make it about murder, my answer has to be about one of the four murders. And notice how they only gave you one. Just like they only gave you one uh, uh, assumption of the mortgage answer they gave you one assumption of the risk answer the other answers are that much more stupid now a lot of people get it down to b and d because you forget at this time of year with all the studying which one's the reckless and which one's the negligent one john is it the, the the i always get those confused so stop doing the question and go back to the rule and in 10 minutes okay murder manslaughter four murders two manslaughters put the rule back in your head and then walk around the house and keep saying it you have to acknowledge what law you're forgetting now so you know what to be looking for later. The more confident you are here with the law, the more present you are when you read the questions. If you're just reading them to see how you do, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to be doing very well. Fix the problem. Some subjects you're doing really well in, then you keep doing the questions. You recognize as a subject or two, you should stop pull that out of the program and maybe go back to review the law. That's what I think. That's why I said it the first time we met. When you make a mistake, don't care about the that you made the mistake. Always be asking, why did I make the mistake? And if it was the rule, then fix the rule before you go back to do more questions. Excellent. Civ Pro, give this one a shot. Facts on the call. So they make this about judgment as a matter of law. Judgment as a matter of law. People get confused between summary judgment and judgment as a matter of law. God knows I used to. I hate Civ Pro 2. Too many motions, John. They all look the same. This is my point. Each motion has a little buzzwordy definition. Summary judgments when there's no genuine dispute of material fact. Judgment as a matter of law. There's not enough evidence for a reasonable jury to conclude the other guy's liable, blah, blah, blah. Jury evidence. There is evidence. There isn't enough evidence. From the facts. What is this fact? I don't tell you. Did the tavern do anything wrong? The man sued the tavern for his injuries. Correct? Both parties move for judgment. Is there evidence that the tavern was negligent or not? No. This guy was an idiot. Exactly. Does it tell you that the tavern did anything wrong? No. He left and he got into his own trouble. Exactly. In fact, what does it tell you about what the tavern did? They refused him service. Would it be another hypo if they gave him 48 shots knowing he was sloshed and then let him go? Yes. But is that what happened here? No. So again, I go into the answers because I took the extra 30 seconds to walk through the facts, walk through, judge the matter of law. Is there enough evidence for a jury to find the other guy negligent? What happened here? The tavern let him out. He got into trouble. The tavern didn't do anything wrong. I know the tavern's going to win because there's not enough evidence. That's what the facts are telling me. Not the best answer, the most specific answer. So when I go into the answers, what am I looking for? 
Answer choice C. And even if I got it down to grant the tavern's motion C and D, notice they are not the same. Because it's undisputed by being ejected from the tavern, the man was put at risk? No. The man is suing for personal injury, which means negligence. Was the tavern negligent? Fact, fact, fact. Don't read, you know, one of the things I believe, most people let the language in the answers lead them. You want to lead the answer choices, meaning you're going into the answer saying the tavern, no, from the facts, the tavern wasn't negligent. It said they refused them service. They can't do anything more. What answer is saying that? No evidence the tavern breached the duty to the man. And notice they give you the negligency language. Always pick the answer most specific. So when you got it down to those two, contrast the difference and always connect it back to the facts. Issue spotting. What is each answer about? Not the best. If you don't know what the issue is, then you don't know what answer you're looking for. So when you see these questions, how should the court rule? Uh, the neighbor makes a claim against the man. There's some of these questions we did where it just was generic. Is the statement admissible? Is it constitutional? When the call of the question doesn't name things specifically, you better know from that fact pattern before you look at the answer. Even when it says murder, which it did, there's four of them. I need to know which one from the facts. Even if it says, is John guilty of larceny? Oh, I know larceny, John. I know the rule. But you don't know whether John committed the larceny or not unless you've read the facts. So no matter what information you do glean from the call, the fact pattern is still the most important part because that's going to tell you where everything is. Once again, you want to turn all these questions into a little puzzle. A, B, C, D. Imagine that you were writing out, underlining, initialing, giving each answer a word or a phrase. S, L, N, E, G. Murder. Pick a phrase. But turn more of the, these questions into what I call little puzzles rather than these. There's no legal reasoning. If you're not comfortable with law, that you make a list of the rules you're forgetting. Go back and shove the rules in your head. You knew the rule and maybe getting into the answers too quick, doing too many questions too quickly, trying to focus on your numbers rather than the reading. These are all the common mistakes that everybody is making now. So reset your focus of the reading. If you have 1.8 minutes per question, where should most of that time be in the facts and the call? What's the issue? What does it tell me? Did he do it? Is he guilty? Is it constitutional? What did the facts say? I, if I know that, now I know what answer I'm looking for, and I could be much more specific because it's easier to find the answer when you know what you're looking for, and the wrong answers should look more wrong. Not I'm getting it down to two. You're getting it down to two because they both say yes. The two yes answers are never the same. The two constitutional answers are never the same. It's all about the facts. The slower you go here, the faster you actually go in the answers. People think it's going to slow me down, John. No, what you're doing is slowing yourself down because you're reading so fast here, you're staring at the answers, and then you have to go back and reread. I'm suggesting take a minute and 40 here. You take 10 seconds in the answers. Not only do you know what you're looking for, you see that the others are wrong. You shut up and pick it, and you've got a bunch of additional questions correct. What about finishing, John? Remember, the goal isn't to finish the test. The goal is to get more right. You're trying to get as many raw questions correct right as possible. So even, although it won't happen, but even if it did, and you got to question 97, and they say, time's up, if you got 10 or 15 more of the first 97 right, by definition, you've already passed. Who cares about the last three? If you race through the first 100 because you want to finish, but you leave all these reading mistakes out on the table, by definition, that's where all the points are coming from. Practice tests. Where should you be? Again, I, I want you to get to February 1st and feel as comfortable as you can with as much law. Then I recommend daily sets of 25, 30. You can increase that every week, 30 to 35, 35 to 40. You're only taking the MBE. You have nothing else to do. You can do an extra 40, 45. You can kind of be, live in the between that 30 to 50 a day range. You know your time. You know your schedule. Don't do more. Do the quality. You build some stamina. You build some pace. Fair enough. What about the uh, OPEs on Bar? How many of those should I do? I would do the ones that are on there. I wouldn't do 200. I would do every Saturday, I would do 100, okay? Because again, what do you do? It takes a half a day to do it. It takes a half a day to review. Tomorrow, you don't want to do another one, okay? What would I do? I'd review my mistakes. I'd go back to smaller sets and keep reviewing the law. But what's the most important thing now when we're getting to the end of January? Don't forget to balance your essay portion. 
whether you did great on it, you're doing great on adaptive art, you're doing great on your mock tests from your commercial course. Most people who do really well on the mock test, the number goes right back down by the end of February. Why? Because you stop doing MBE, you stop reviewing rules because you're focusing on your essays and your MPTs. Balance the two. This is huge. If you're doing a UBE jurisdiction, the huge majority of the law that you know for MBE are the same in all those essays. The more comfortable you're continually reciting those rules, the better you're doing your essay. And that's why you don't do 100 multiple choice a day because you have no time for your essay. 30 to 40 to 50, enough to practice, keep my reading comp approach good so I have time for the rest of the day for my essay. As some of you may have seen, uh, Adaptive Bar started a writing program, which has been getting very, very good feedback. Uh, so if you feel you need some help with that, certainly that would be a great uh, uh, option for that supplemental help for essay writing. But don't feel like you can kill MBE and just do okay on one, on the other. It doesn't work that way. You don't. You, you can do really much better on one, but you don't want to do pretty good on the other. Balance in February is the number one thing. A little bit of everything is the key. So just do enough questions now so that you're also doing enough on your essay or MPT prep. That's the most labor intensive, of course, because you have to do the writing. Don't hold me to anything because every jurisdiction is different. It's curved. There's no right or wrong. There's no finite. And the numbers change every six months. So again, don't hold me to this. If you're in the 50s, not now, I'm talking, you know, in the next couple of weeks, you know, you need a couple of extra points. Usually you could still be okay and do, be, much, be much better with the, with the writing and that could take you over the top. But the whole country's asking, where should I be? You want to be in that mid 60 range by exam day cumulatively. That means you could be at 56, 57 in property and be at 68 to 70 in tort. I'm talking round numbers, low to mid 60s, low to mid 60s, normal everyday average. Most jurisdictions, you don't need to pass the MBE. You're just looking to get as many points right, which is why I'm saying don't do 100 questions on MBE a day to think you can improve and not practice your essay. Because ultimately, even if you hit a ceiling with MBE, get a couple of points better. It makes all the difference in the world. But then the essay portion can take you over the top. So you have to be balancing both. The better you know the law in both, the more those the more those questions and essays will improve. And the more you're balancing both parts, the better it's going to be. So just enough MBE practice every day, but really, really focus on that approach reading comprehension. When you make a mistake on Adaptive Bar, look at the difference between the red and the green, okay? I'm saying it was C. The correct answer was A. What did I do wrong? Was it the rule? I forgot a piece of that definition. I need to go back into my notes and shove the rule in my head. I continue to be bad at assignment third-party rights. I just can't figure out products liability. I just can't figure out hearsay. Then, you know, I have those lectures where you don't have to get the whole subject. You can just get pieces. And in 30, 40 minutes, I'll fix those little pocket areas. And then all of a sudden you go back and you see what you're doing wrong. Don't just do more, fix the problem. If it's the rule, fix the rule, and don't practice questions to learn the law. You're wasting all these beautiful questions. Fix the rules first, and then go do more practice. But just enough practice so you're balancing your, your uh, uh, essays and MPT. If you have more time on a weekend, let's say, again, that's when you can do a Saturday for an OPE. That's perfectly fine, but don't be doing them over and over again, just chasing a score. This is the other problem this time of year. Too many students are just chasing a number. You're gonna, and you're like the bad gambler at the casino, you know, hit me again, hit me, you're just sitting there uh, more, more, more. And even if you do well on a given day, the number usually doesn't stay. I hear from students all the time, oh, John, I hit 68 today. Okay, but then I don't hear from them for four days because it goes right back down to 55 because they were just happily getting a couple of extra questions they knew right that day. Then it goes back down the next day. You're looking for consistency. And how do I gain more consistency? Better rule comfort and better reading comprehension. Issue spotting. What am I looking for? Trust what the facts say. What is each answer about? Shut up and pick it. You make a mistake because of the rule, go back now and fix the rule. You make a mistake because, oh, I went over there, I should have gone here. I didn't spot the issue. He was right. I picked an answer about equal protection. The answer was about due process. I picked an answer about negligence. The whole issue was strict liability. I'm going too quick. I need to slow down, like he said during this thing. I need to focus more on the facts. Most of the time, the call of the question doesn't specify the particular name of the rule. 
you have to figure that it tells you the subject matter, but it doesn't tell you the specific rule. That's why I'm preaching what's the issue from the facts. What is it about? What did it say? It said that the guy was released and it said he assumed the mortgage. It said the dog was ferocious and it said he read a sign. You will be shocked if you go back and look at some of the recent mistakes you made, that if you'd slowed down and trusted or seen more of these words and phrases, they slip into the facts, how obvious more of these answers would be. So again, big picture. This time of the year does suck. Use the weekend to recharge the battery. Be honest with yourself. What did I say a couple of months or so ago when we did this? If you can't speak the rule, you need a little refresher. No one's going to remember everything. But the more you can speak, the more you're getting on MBE and on your essays, especially in the MEE jurisdictions. You feel good about a couple subjects, then do practice sets in the subjects you're feeling comfortable on and leave the bad subjects out. Isolate those and fix the rules first. Then you go back and do small sets of questions, five to seven, seven to 10 in that subject. Build some momentum. Don't go from zero to 100. Build some momentum, getting back up to speed. I feel more confident now with property. I feel more comfortable with contracts. I'm okay. Now you incorporate it into your mix set. I would do things in practice mode for now until you're seeing that consistent number. You really, really are fixing the rules. And when you feel like you're pretty much, that number is kind of evening out in the next week to 10 days, you get into February, then I'd be doing your mix sets in exam mode. So you're beginning to see one question after the other and kind of weaning off whether you're right or wrong so you can get comfortable for what the actual test looks like. So again, whatever you're comfortable with, I'm in practice mode, I'm mixing those sets. Whatever rules or subjects I need to isolate, fix the law now so most of February can be practice. Then you lump them all together and do a nice, good daily regimen of practice. Leave it 30 to 50, give or take, giving yourself plenty of time to practice your essays and MPT. Always be better. What if I'm just doing the MBE, John? Still, I, would do, I wouldn't be doing 100 a day because then you're just practicing questions. You have more time, you're only doing MBE. 30, 35, 35, 40, 45 to 50. And I would be reviewing law in a single subject every day. Just balance. If you don't have to do that extra work, then don't do it. Don't burn out. And just don't do the questions for the sake of doing the questions. It's all about the quality of the reading, not the amount. Good. And again, how many should you have done? There's no freaking number. Stay off Reddit, okay? Crazy. There's no finite number. You can't be doing six or seven. I mean, you want to be doing more than six or 700, but you don't have to get to 2,500 or some fictitious number. You know that if you're doing, which is why I believe 30 to 50 a day and over the course of a week, your number is evening out into that low to mid 60s. And slowly you can steal an extra couple of percentage points each day, each week, because you're making fewer reading mistakes. The number ultimately isn't going to matter. If you know how to do the 30 to 40 to 50 and you know the law, you're going to do 200. Don't put the pressure on these. How many? What about that? How am I reading the 20 or 30 or 50 today? What they call mindfulness exercises. Let me be mindful on what I'm doing right now, because again, otherwise you're chasing numbers. Better you read these 30 and the 40 tomorrow and the 45 the next day. You're seeing the same rules over and over again. All they're doing is changing the hypo. Get out of the number garbage and focus on more accuracy, more quality. And slowly but surely, that's what's going to pay off by exam day. As you get more consistent and confident with the reading, the fewer silly mistakes you make, which automatically makes the number go up. Be honest with yourself. What's the number one thing you need doing multiple choice? confidence. It's a chicken and egg. You can't have confidence if you don't know enough law. You know more law, you can focus more on the facts and take it what take what they say. That makes you more confident. So what can you do in every single question on the bar, no matter what, to shut up and pick it? Two answers are never correct. Two or three answers, four answers may be legally and factually true, but only one answer a question is the most specific to what the facts say, which is why I'm saying connect the dots. There's not a best answer. There's not a strongest answer. There's the one that matches the facts. Connect the dots, reading comprehension, focus on quality, not quantity, balance essay with uh, uh, with MBE. You need some help, try out the Adaptive Art writing program. You need help with the uh, approach. Check out the Mastering the MBE video. If you need any help with specific sections 
of the material. You know, I'm, I'm doing that. You can get those little portions, little subtopics if you needed it. If you feel you have the outline, stop doing the questions for a day or two in a subject and go back and really know the law and then rebuild the momentum slowly but surely. So you're maxing out by mid-February. I could then be doing 40, 50 a day exam mode, practicing how I'm taking the test. Focus on the reading comp, focus on the issue spotting. And again, for the fifth time, but the last time. Three parts to every question, the facts, the call, and the answer choices. Of your proverbial 1.8 minutes, where should you be spending the bulk of your time? The facts and the call. Know what answer you're looking for. And even if a property or contract question takes you two minutes and 20 seconds, two minutes and 30 seconds, the next 10 are only going to take you 40, 50 seconds. There's the timing feature on Adaptabar. 99% of the people doing practice questions, when you look at that timing thing, the most amount of questions you did were between zero and one minute. The next one was between one and two minutes. And those are your highest percentages. Once you're spending more than two minutes on a question, which is the smallest amount of questions you do, the number, the percentage begins to fall off. That should tell you, hey, most of these questions aren't taking me more than two minutes. And if a couple do, I can afford it because most of them are not. And I'm doing the best when I'm between zero and two minutes. Focus your time up here so I know what answer I'm looking for. What is each answer about? It was about the assumption of the risk. Shut up and pick the answer about assumption of the risk. It was about the murder. Shut up and pick the answer about the murder. Connect those dots. The more you do that and use your missed questions as examples, compare the red, compare the green. What were those answers about? You will see those mistakes. If you can't see it, you're just doing practice questions blindly. Always ask the why. That's how you fix, and slowly you gain more confidence. Good refresher. Psh, psh. Here we go. Take a deep breath. Go watch some TV. Cruise into the weekend. Be honest. If I need a boot camp review of some law, this is the weekend to do it. So I hit the ground running next week. Back to practice questions. If you're taking your mock test, focus on, again, the review of rules so you can read those questions the right way. Keep up the great work. Thanks for coming. Shut up and pick it. That's what we're talking about. Fix the problems. And we'll look forward to seeing you again really, really soon. Take care. Stay confident.